This channel is not intended for children. Please kickstart responsibly. All right, everybody. It's Mother's Day weekend, and we're back. We're looking at all the cool stuff coming out in May. This video will go just about to the end of May, and then next week we'll start with some June stuff. Got a pretty, you know, loaded up June. I will tell you, though, that Kickstarter news, they had to lay off a bunch of people because they've uh, just had so few um, campaigns going on right now. Not in our space. In the board games RPG stuff, we've had just as many as we always do. So uh, maybe just a slight dip. We've got plenty of stuff still going on, things coming out. And uh, I don't think it's going to affect any of these campaigns. Um, it was just staff that would support other things. So maybe the people that go through the projects we love stuff and ignore the really good campaigns. You know, that kind of thing. So uh, we're going to get started on ours. I I'm going to tell you one thing. I'm going to give you a tip. Since everybody's making sourdough, I've been doing it for years now. Uh, I'm going to tell you one big tip. Put some water like a quarter cup, 250 mils, whatever the equivalent is, um, in the oven when you get it started, when you go to bake it. The steam will make it so the crust is soft. I have spent $3,000 on a root canal trying out sourdough stuff because the crust got all crispy and whatnot, and I bit into it and cracked a tooth. Don't do that. Just put a little bit of water at the end. It's the same way that they make like Roman bread or, or Wonder Bread or any of the others that makes the... Uh, outside crust soft is just by steaming it. So if you put a little thing on the, on the bottom of your oven and you're going to make it for your mom, do that and she won't lose a tooth. There you go. Let's get on with the board games. First up we have Next Goal Wins. This is obviously a soccer game and it's a little bit different because it doesn't necessarily have a field. What you do is you create decks and instead of moving minis around a board or and playing it like you would with FIFA, you build your team with various stats, and then you go in one-to-one, -one, um, uh, I don't know what you call them, head-to-head uh, -head matches of some kind, where it's like one player versus another player, and uh, whatever you built with, say you had more defense, say you had more offense, say you had um, some type of better passing or interceptions, whatever the case is that your characters have, and I think they're based on actual people. I don't know if they got licenses to do it or they're just rolling the dice. Uh, maybe it's uh, a public figure situation, so they're not required. But uh, the names kind of look familiar to me, although I know very, very little about uh, soccer in general. And uh, yeah, I mean, it seems to be well represented of a bunch of people's different teams. So... Uh, you know, inclusive to whoever is good and just make the best team you can. And if you can't uh, run around on the grass or whatever, then this would be a good opportunity to just think about your player options as opposed to just how well you kick. And then we have a campaign that's all about roads. This is Roads to Adventure. These are STL files you can print off yourself. And they're going to be fairly large, so I would say FDM is good, 0.1 millimeter if you can. And... Um, it's just to get you from one place to another, scatter terrain, whatever it is that uh, will set it up for your uh, RPG table. Maybe you just need terrain for some other type of war game or whatever the case is. But there's lots of different styles. Some of them look like ruins. Some of them just like old train tracks. You can dress them up however you want. Dilapidated, brand new, however you want them to, to be situated. It's a great idea and something that uh, you know a lot of people will just get buildings. There's other stuff that needs to be on the table to give it that inclusive, or that, uh, what do you want to call it? It's uh, at the atmosphere, you know what I mean? The complete atmosphere is, uh, is what this helps with. Then straight out of Provo, Utah, we have Frog Knight. And this is a game with a bunch of standees, so it's not miniatures, stays cheap. And a very interesting concept where you have this continually shrinking board, and that continues to force players towards the center of the board, make them interact with each other, and speeds up the pace, which is, uh, you know, a great way to keep tension high and, um, you know, keep people excited. It has a fair bit of humor added to it and uh, little cards and things that are available. The idea being it's supposed to be family friendly, not necessarily the same as what you would have found in Battletoads. I don't know if you remember that uh, video game way back when. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's still a great idea. Frogs are 
fairly underutilized, I would say, as protagonists. The only thing I really see him in these days is as Grungs. And uh, in Alter Quest, there was another, uh, the, the Frocks, I think those they're called. Um, so, you know, it's, it's just a neat idea to have something that is, uh, you know, a common, mostly harmless in the United States, not counting Australia. I know you guys have a huge problem with uh, the cane toads down there. But, uh, you know, something that uh, a human doesn't have to worry too much about in the United States. Might be fun. Then we have a really awesome idea, and they even give you a free sample. So if you want one of these scatter pucks, which holds your paint in a very thematic way, and you go on and you 3D print it yourself, you can get the uh, STL file to make one. And they fit from the look of it. They've got all these GW paints all set up. For me, I mean, I'd be swapping paints out. I, I think I have 30 different colors <laughs> sitting on my desk right now. Um, and then maybe 70 sitting there on the shelf or the wall. So five or six, it would take up a lot of room, but maybe just painting out of these and having these pots available real fast will uh, help keep you inspired, especially if you were going to do a lot of the same model over and over again and you have, you're using those same colors in an assembly line, then it would be make more sense uh, because it can, like I said, keep you inspired. You have all these little terrain looking things on the desk and uh, you'll be thinking about whatever car or uh, mini or whatever that uh, will fit with that theme that you're working on right maybe get some other ideas for color uh, you know or just inspired to play I, I like the idea I think they look cool but they do take up extra space and then you'll be swapping them in and out unless you print a bunch of them so it depends on the type of painter you are then we have a new army for whatever game you want to play in. This is Imperium Immortalis, and they have cavalry, they've got big artillery, they look like a steampunk version of the Huns. They've got, uh, you know, that spike on the helmet and that distinctive look. The uh, names are all very Germanic for everything, but you can use it for any game you want. That's kind of the intention. Um, the steampunk look and feel means that while it does have everything a horse, uh, you know, uh, for the cavalry, that maybe you could still put it into a sci-fi world um, with a little bit of modification. That part is up to you. They just made a bunch of really cool looking things. There's far more than what you see here. It is a fairly complete army and, you know, just something extra to throw out there on the table. Um, maybe you don't want to, uh, you know, I guess World War One, World War Two would have been... Uh, Oh, you know what? I just noticed if you look really closely on the horses, some of them have robot legs. So even then you can even go further, basically all the time periods. That's even better. So nice sculpts, good idea. And uh, if you don't want something that would otherwise have been Germany in the 30s, you can replace it with these guys. Next up we have Valiant Wars. <clears throat> I'm not sure if we covered this in February when it originally came around, but this is the next time through. This is a competitive game, needs at least two players that is very much in an anime style and the gimmick is it has not just deck building but a press your luck system of deck building so if you want to add that gambling component feel free to give it a shot um, obviously this is something that uh, you know is a little more on the the family friendly end skews a little bit younger so if you're interested take a look at valiant wars and then i say every time i'm not much of a golfer so i don't really know too much about what this is going to do for your game but if you want to literally roll the dice and create a different type of stroke i guess um you, a different type of uh, of, uh i don't know a uh, club i don't know it's something to make your golfing experience you're supposed to take it with you onto the course i don't know if it's mini golf or regular golf or whatever the case is but uh, it's supposed to randomize things up. Now, I know a lot of people, they bet on golf games. Now, this is just one more thing you can bet on. Like, if you get your role or they get their role, like, who can do better with whatever the thing is? So, uh, it's just a cheap way to randomize things. Maybe the other people around you are going to hate you because you're doing so many crazy things. Um, those types of... Uh, Old folks on the, the putting green or whatnot aren't exactly that big on change. 
But if you're willing to, to deal with that, this may be something that will uh, make it a lot more interesting for you. And who knows, practicing all these different types of, of uh, clubs or shots or whatever might make your game significantly better. Then we have Defend Earth, please. Then uh, th this is as the best way I can kind of... It's, uh, Matthew Inman's artwork is very much in an influence here, from what I can tell. And the gameplay seems to be a combination of bears versus babies and exploding kittens, uh, done in a different way. So it just feels like the people that created this game out in uh, Boston were big fans and took those mechanics, blended them together, and made it into this uh, pig versus asteroid or Earth <laughs> system. Um, yeah, so maybe they play exploding kittens, bears versus babies, and angry birds all the time, and that's what created the, uh, the theme here. And if you're a fan of any of those things, then you may be the type of person that will enjoy this particular game and uh, may want it for your family-ish, friendly-ish uh, play experience. And then we have a very popular campaign. This is the new Dungeon Craft series, two terrain books for D&D. So you can see Castles and Keeps, and then one that is specifically made to help you if you're running Curse of Strahd. Now, what are these Dungeon Craft? Well, it's a book of like rooms and other things you can pop out, and it will just help you create terrain on your normal board. So if you have one of those uh, wet or dry erase play mats, and it has all the squares on it and you're ready to go, you just drop these in, they should fit the same type of scale that uh, is commonly accepted for the D&D minis, and uh, there you go, instant game. So if uh, you'd like to jump in, there's lots of folks that will join you on it. They're full color from what I can tell, they all look pretty good, and uh, while they have a lot going on, they're still generic enough to be utilized in a lot of different campaigns and you get a lot of use out of it. But if you go ahead and you bought all those new terrain pieces and you're not sure what to build with them, that's what Fantasy Sites, or City Sites and Scenes 2 is for. It was not that long ago that we saw the first one come through. They are cranking them out. Um, if you have a lot of terrain or anything like that, or you just need a new type of city, you want it to have its own unique feel, these are things that you can just plug and play into whatever scenario you're running you're uh, doing an early homebrew, or maybe you're just tired <laughs> and you want some help, then that's what this type of stuff is for. It's all really well done. Uh, you can take a look at the samples and the various, um, you know, the previous publications that uh, these folks out in uh, Texas have come up with. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's all there it's for whatever campaign you need. It's really just backgrounds. If you were to run it through Pathfinder, if you were to run it through one of the many, many, many other uh, fantasy RPGs out there, or just medieval type RPGs out there, I think you'll find a lot of use. Um, or even if you just want to go through and, and find new types of rumors, you can take the stories of the various cities and turn them into like ancient uh, rumors and whatnot uh, that your players can encounter. But there's a lot of reasons to pick these things up, and uh, like I said, just take a look at the sample and get that imagination going. And this one lost me when it put the ore in there, and this is Six Drux or Rock and Roll. And it is a thing where you have a word association, you pick a letter, and you go from there, last person that can create a word, starting with that letter associated with either Sex, Drugs, or Rock and Roll, is out. Okay, if you have creative people, they're very good with the uh, English language and history and... Um, you don't have a bunch of rules lawyers that would say, oh, that's hip hop, that's not rock and roll, or that's country, that's not rock and roll, or I don't know, it was only hand stuff, so it's not sex, whatever. The uh, If you don't have those types of people in there, then uh, you might find this a lot more fun. Um, I think it can go really good, or it could be really boring, and it's going to be entirely based on the group that you're with and possibly the amount of partying they've done in their lifetime and wish they could still do. So, throwing it out there, if you've got a very uh, raunchy group, then this could be for you. Then we have 
This is Wickedness. This is a role-playing game based on the Sleepaway Camp, uh, I think is the, the one it is. It is specifically to be re played by three people and no more, no less than three people. It explores... Um, as it says it's, it explores some type of queer culture setup, and um, all right, that's fine. If they specifically have to have uh, that being the, uh, the, the nature of the story, I'm always of the belief that you can make any story, and it should be system agnostic, and you don't have to develop new systems just to fit one particular or two particular things. Like, there's, there's so much more storytelling uh, that you can get out of it. And what if you had a fourth person? What if somebody didn't show up? Can you complete the game? Um, those are just some options and things to throw out there. There are much more popular um, systems that could incorporate queer culture uh, into them that more people would be familiar with. You don't have to rewrite the wheel in order to um, get, you know, uh, a certain type of story told. Maybe it does, and maybe it's something that makes this better, but I'm not sure. So, throwing all that out there. It's a game, and it's got all those things. I kind of feel the same way about the game of real life here. It feels like it's something that you would play in a therapist's office, or that a life coach would bring in to be a fun little game for you, as opposed to something that you would play on your own. This appears to be the type of thing that you want to escape from when you play a game, and... Um, I don't know how they necessarily combat that. I would say maybe a less sanitized art style. They probably paid a lot of money, and you know that's that's more power to them. This uh, neo hieroglyphic um, setup that they've got going on, but like I said, it, it feels sanitized. It feels um, medical, and that's why I say it feels like it would be the type of thing that you would play in a therapist's office. So. Not sure if, if that's the, the full extent of what this game offers. Throwing it out there, there might be some therapists out there that could really use this. Or something that uh, you're trying to get your uh, screwball kid into, you know, thinking about life in a different way. You know, throwing it out there. I try to be complete with these. Then from a great company for getting out of the real world, we have the Polyhedral Dice Adventure calendars, which means these are their advent calendars. This is the numbers two through four. They came out with one last year and, or it might've been the year before. It, it's a previous product and an expansion on that where you get these uniquely shaped dice every day. And it helps you keep track and maybe you'll play with them, maybe you don't, maybe you just keep them on a shelf. Maybe you put them in an aquarium. That part is up to you, but it is just a nice way to, to tick off the days and it doesn't necessarily have to fall around Christmas. You can do it with whatever you want. These guys at Black Oak Workshop come out with all kinds of really neat looking stuff. And uh, maybe you want to find something else in the, their catalog. Feel free to check out their page. And then, uh, you know, you can always click on my stuff in the description. And then you go to their page and then you find the links to go from there. Um, that's why all those links are there. It's for you to discover. And uh, you'll see all kinds of incredible woodworking and, um, and like bags and other stuff. Lots of neat things. Black Oak Workshop has come out with uh, over the time I've been doing this channel, at least. And out of the land of the Kiwis, we have the Witch's Hobble. And this is a 3D printable set of terrain that you can use for witches, apothecaries. You can just use them maybe even as grain silos, whatever you want. They're just little stone houses that would fill up the terrain some of them are demolished. You can take them apart. They've got even outhouses. You don't really see that much uh, going on with that level of detail. Um, yeah, and it's cheap. You can print it off yourself and uh, pop in the train, paint it up any way you want. Then we have a new version of Island Siege. This is their second edition. And Island Siege is a card game with some meeples in it and some dice. That, But there's no real big board or anything to worry about. So it's, it's just kind of cards as you lay them out where you set up a colony and you blow up other people's colonies. That's kind of how it, it works. You uh, have a little bit of, um, I don't know, resource gathering and building. And uh, I don't know, it, it feels a little bit 
like a very simplified version of that uh, Assassin's Creed Black Sails game. Uh, was it four? It was three or four? One of those Assassin's Creeds where you uh, ran around as uh, Matt Ryan's voice and uh, blew up uh, various uh, places around Spain, I think it was. It was a lot of fun. Reminiscent of that. You're running through, you're setting things up, you're conquering, you're exploring, you're doing all that cool business, but just with little meeples. And if I had to criticize, I would, you know, say, hey, custom meeples would be good. They're a little on the generic side, but you can use it anywhere you need to. Or you can go find stuff from another campaign that you enjoy or a different other pirate game that you like, and you can use those for these. It's a simple enough game, though. If you had to, you take it on vacation and just blast away and have a good time. Then we have a, this is a print and play game. It's called Cellulite Swell. I don't know if I pronounced it right, but it's the best I got. And you are playing a surfer. Seems pretty neat. You get a couple of dice, you print these things off, you got a little wave going on, and you just do the best you can as the, the wave moves around to get, get points. This is one of those hashtag give back things where um, you're just trying to get more people on these uh, small games to uh, you just give what you want and uh, and you know support a, a you support them and they support you by offering it at the lowest price possible. So yeah, if you're into surfing, these guys are in Edmonton, Canada. I don't know how much surfing takes place there, but uh, you know. If you're in Hawaii or California and, you know, it's a rainy day and you can't go out there or there's lightning or whatever, eh, maybe, you know, you play one of these games. Then we have another modified RPG. This is Skull Diggers. And the idea behind this is your village is under attack, but you're an outcast and the village themselves are attacking you. So you have a fairly complex setup going on. It's a single setting. It's not like a big open world where you add all your own stuff. It's a, it's a quick little story that you play from multiple angles. Sometimes you have to think like a warrior, sometimes like an explorer, sometimes like a citizen. And it's not so combat driven. That is the reason why they've put together their own little rules is uh, that trifecta of roles. And that's about all I can glean from the page. If this it all sounds interesting to you, you know where to click. Then we have a new steampunk game. This is Crisis at Steamfall Genesis, and it has a solo mode. You can get it in standees, or you can get the models. And otherwise, it is a basic adventure game. Uh, it refers to itself as highly tactical, so you probably need some, some uh, you know, real forethought into where you're going to move and uh, how, you, what type of action economy you're going to be utilizing. And uh, it says it's going to require tight control over your actions. So that might be what makes it difficult, is having to think so far ahead and where all your resources are going to go. Um, if you're interested in this kind of thing, then uh, they got you covered over at BD Games. It's, uh, it's, it seems interesting. And, you know, there is kind of a, uh, a, an emptiness, an abyss of steampunk things that could be out there. And I thought maybe uh, Rise of Smog uh, or World of Smog, Rise of Moloch would have fit that, but it didn't have a solo version. So this might be the only way to scratch that itch, itch if you have, uh, you know, the solo uh, or co-op in you there that you've been looking to play in a steampunk world. It's got a big monkey in a, in a hat, smoking a cigar. It's got a plague doctor. What else could you want? And then we have... Something to remind you of the worst of what's going on right now. <laughs> Hoarding time. Um, I'll tell you guys, I feel, I always feel the same way when I see these th things that are based on what's going on right now. Don't. Have some longevity. People want the escape. Now, conceptually, it is just around running around a, um, uh, some type of area and then picking up uh, different pieces off of a list. I think you can give it any theme and uh, uh, or put it anywhere in any other type of shop, any other time period, any anything to make it not about right now and it would actually fulfill the, um, the goal that they're trying to do is to put out a good game um, that is, you know, as long as it's like a couple steps away, it might remind people just enough, 
where they're familiar from what's going on right now, that the game could still be fun. But otherwise, escape. We all need the escape. Think about that, folks. Escape. Then we have a drinking game called Power Struggle. This is obviously not intended to ever not be included with some form of alcohol. So if you don't drink or you were planning on playing it with younger people, no. <laughs> That's just how it's going to go. They, uh, they have a bunch of rules and different things. It's, it's like a mishmash of every other uh, drinking game. I don't want to be negative. Um, I always end up just being thirsty on the drinking games, and then, then I end up drinking. So I think it could be fun. If I were still 20, if I was still in college, then this would be the most fun game I've got. Um, but otherwise, if you got mixed company... You got the old standby, Cards Against Humanity, that looks exactly like this and doesn't play that differently. Uh, it just doesn't have any rules to, uh, to follow. And basically the whole group has to follow every single rule each time. So, um, yeah, it's... it's I, I forget the name of the, of the... The ones of those drinking games where you have rules and you put them on cards. It's basically the same thing. Then before Disney took it over... Did you know that Neverland and Peter Pan were books? Yeah! And that's what Adventures of Neverland is based on. So you're running around, you're fighting against Captain Hook, you're doing all the cool stuff with the Lost Boys, and it is nothing to do with the Disney version. So if you want to play something that's a little more, more close um, to those adventures, then uh, you know you got a nice map. Uh, running around Neverland, you, know, you got the all the different characters: Smee, Tinkerbell, Captain Hook. You got, uh, I think that's Tiger Lily, and you know Wendy. And it's it's a very nice game with nice looking components. They look like they're ready for the era. You got standees, so it's not too expensive. And if you wanted to introduce your you know group into something that was a little more classic and a little less animated and sanitized. Adventures in, Wonder in Neverland. Why not? Then taking a spin with the rules on races in D&D, we have Ancestry Awakened. This is a replacement for the race system, and what it does is it creates the concept of ancestry. So 40 new, basically races. <laughs> they, uh, they talk about um, different types of uh, branches and options that maybe you don't like how simple... You know, hey, you're this race and this is what you get. You want it to be a little more complicated. You want more options involved. Here you go. It's uh, it's an interesting way of thinking about it. Taking out the concept of race, which could be, you know, misconstrued in the modern terms. Uh, lots of different ways. And, uh, and then just taking it to the point of thinking about, oh, I've got this, this complicated lineage of uh, all these heroes and things that have happened uh, before me and things that they might have done or, or uh, you know, in the case of the Machinima, like, who built me, right? Who's, who's my Geppetto? Don't know. Um, you use those instead of uh, Warforged. And you've got the crazy-looking Lich dude skull going on. Um, I'm not sure what that uh, armored guy is holding. But uh, you want to be a goblin volleyball player because there's some monster races, you're set. And if you just want crazy monsters, Ekphrastic Beasts is there for you. As you can see, this art is kind of nuts. Um, that's the point, really, is for it to be nuts. It's to bring something that you've never seen, tells a story you've never heard, and can really spice up your, uh, your sessions. You don't know what that tent has inside of it. You don't know where it's going to pop out of that cave. Your dreams may uh, lead to some crazy waking nightmare. You don't know what it is. Um, but that's the point. You have all these crazy, uh, near Lovecraftian um, uh, concepts of... of uh, I won't want to say it's just Lovecraftian. It's not the only type of artwork that's thrown in here. But it's all nuts. And that's the point. It's just icky and it's nuts. And if you're into that type of dark gaming, here you go. Throw it into your RPG. Then this is not going to help any of the English speakers in the audience. Sorry, but I've got some really nice uh, version. Uh, you know, people that uh, need a version in French, 
and that's what Gaslands is about. The uh, Craftsman, who is probably the nicest YouTuber of all, the most interesting to watch, far beyond what I can do as far as uh, being entertaining, has been doing a big series on making Gasland conversions. So if you're in Montreal area, Quebec, or France, or Haiti, or wherever it is that you speak French uh, as your native language, and you would prefer to have this game with you, and you're going to go watch Craftman after this, and uh, start making all your little cars into little Mad Max creations, you're set. So there you go. Hope you enjoy it. Then we got a game that does the impossible. It made baseball look interesting for a few minutes. This is a tabletop baseball game where you use like pinball type functions to try to pitch and then you got as you can see we have the pull tab thing and you swing so yeah uh i showed it to a friend of mine who's super into baseball has kids i was like why don't you get this for your kids and he's like because my sons will destroy it immediately that's a solid point if your kids are too young to not break everything then they might not be that fun to play with but if your kids are starting to get towards that double digit range then uh, maybe it'd be worth it to uh, pop this out. It reminds me of the toy commercials from the 80s as to what I wish it would have all been. Um, yeah, I mean, if you're not going to be able to play baseball or t-ball or whatever with your kids, then maybe you can play this. Just throwing that out there. It's going to be about a year or so before uh, we're all back playing sports and watching sports and all that. You can still have the thrill of the game, and you can name them however you want. And uh, I think it's a, it's a very interesting concept. It's not terribly expensive. And uh, maybe you replace some of the players with G.I. Joes and stuff. Who knows? You got a girl, just take the, the players that move and all that, and then replace the other ones with Barbies. No one's going to care. You'll be fine. You'll still get to play. And maybe you don't have kids. You're the kid. And you just need some old school hobgoblins. You want them in, uh, in metal. Satanic Panic has... A big list of catalog that they uh, have been putting out for a while now. Uh, lots of different Kickstarters have been available. And this series just happens to be on Hobgoblins. They're fun to beat up. They're, uh, you can, if you wanted, you can call them regular goblins. You can call them whatever it is that you want it to be. Whatever your, your game has. But uh, sometimes you just need something to mess with. And like I said, these guys are going to be made out of metal. So uh, they'll be quite resilient and uh, a little on the heavy side. So make sure you, you're pl not playing with someone who's going to throw it because that could be dangerous. Then we have a card-based system of removing the DM from 5e rules so that everyone can be a player. And it'll take you to 6th level, at which point I'm pretty sure the spells are going to get a little too complicated. You'll need some RP stuff involved with it. But that doesn't mean you can't have a wild good time. Um, throwing this out there, if there was anything that was needed, it's a system by which people can play, um, D&D &D or 5e or Starfinder, Pathfinder on days off when they don't have anyone else, uh, available to play that they could still kind of scratch the itch and, um, get the feel of the mechanics so that when they do find a group or they do end up talking somebody into it that they can get started and uh, I wish there was more stuff like this out there I'm not sure how well it all is implemented I haven't played through it myself but I like that these people are trying this is their second one that they've done so obviously it was popular enough to try again so it's a good good uh, I think it's it's a good thing to, to look at and then figure out if you're willing to risk your own money um, if on your own satisfaction, but uh, I like the idea. Just throwing that. A game that I feel similarly about in that I like that it exists, but I don't know how about the implementations going on, is the Phantom card game. The Phantom is, I think, the first superhero. And a lot of people these days have no clue what he is or where he's from or any of that. He's a guy that runs around in the jungle. He became very popular in Europe, which is why this is out of Stockholm, Sweden. And uh, I think in Australia, it was also like maintained popularity. In the US, it definitely fell off. Um, they tried to pick it up a couple times. There was a different Phantom game within the last three months, I like to think, uh, that had some miniatures and things in it. Um, it is, 
it is a good property. It is a good IP. They have some Tarzan kind of things going on in that he's in the jungles. Um, they've got some spy kind of stuff going on because nobody knows who he is and he's supposed to be this perennial um, dude. It's a little bit like Batman because he doesn't really have any powers and he's got to think his way through um, to fight against all these various enemies. There's a, there's a wealth of opportunity available and it's just about implementation. Um, card art mainly taken from the comic books so the backs I think they could use a little work but you know otherwise I think it'll be all right then we have a really weird game tapeworm two to four players sit around in someone's intestine and are cutting up the tapeworm if you don't know what a tapeworm is it's a thing that lives in your guts and it can get many yards and meters long uh, 10,000 backers, exactly, from what I've seen so far. Um, a very odd, odd game about something that lives in your poop. When those uh, those guys get long enough, pieces of them break off. They can come out your nose. <laughs> they can go all over uh, your your head. They can they come out through the back end. It's not a pleasant thing to have. Which makes it an interesting way to, you know, spend an evening, especially after you've just eaten. Or maybe before you've just eaten. Oi, when are you going to play this game? When are you going to put this on your table, right? Um, Max Temkin backed it. Uh, he's got a bunch of other, like, super popular games. And uh, that might explain some of the popularity. The artwork looks neat in uh, a cute and evil kind of way. And, yeah, tapeworm. Maybe you want to play it. Then we have a little board game that uh, is played within the box. So the box itself is the board, which is a nice thing to have. Utilize that space as best you can. And um, this is Tiny Ninja's Heroes. This is the second printing, so it was popular enough to, uh, to be reprinted, which is a good sign. It's got a chibi art style, as you can see. It's got some stretch goals from before and stretch goals now. And the other neat thing uh, I wanted to show people, just in case you had some type of disability with color blindness, and I've known many people who have, that's what the dice are set up to do. They're there to make it so that you can uh, easily discern their values, um, even if you have like red green uh, color blindness. So that part is cool. You can get those glasses though. They have glasses now. Apparently they work really well, um, and you'll be able to see things apart. Uh, but otherwise. You want yourself a nice little chibi ninja game? Tiny Ninjas. It's a chibi ninja game. Then we have a new uh, fantasy game. This is Emble Tournament Foundation. It's an expandable card game, but uh, one of the things that you can do is it has simultaneous rounds that you don't have to wait for the other person to complete their turn uh, before you can do anything. You can just keep going at the same time, which helps keep the pace up. You do have to pay attention a different way but uh, it does keep the game moving. So if you're having a hard time, you got too many people around and they're just taking too long to make up their minds, you can throw this on the table and show them how to speed things up a little bit. This is the grandchild of Simon from the 70s or 80s in a whole new high-tech world. This is the Blinks game system. You have these little hexagons that can snap together like a honeycomb of fun and you turn the lights out and you can play. I don't know how bright they get or how easy it will be to play in the, the daylight, um, as obviously they're showing you in the dark so that you focus on what's happening there. Um, it's an expandable system. Each one of the Blink games, there's uh, 18 of them, it has their own unique programming and it acts as a controller for the rest. They snap magnetically. So if you like hockey puck them around, then they'll that's part of one of the games. It'll help snap it together. I don't know how durable it is. If they are, if they do work, this seems amazing. Um, it is a, 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 a disco. <laughs> it is a board game. It is all kinds of crazy fun. Probably best if you're high, but, uh, or a child because, uh, it's like they're high all the time anyway. Right. 
um, and you just follow the little lights as they move around, and yeah, it's it's pretty remarkable. You can look at the various games that are in the description. And I don't know what happened the first time around. Um, they haven't changed the video either. Um, that's a little disturbing for me. The art, you know, it's it's whatever schoolgirl running through the woods Japanese style thing. Uh, it's Red Riding Hood um, in, uh, in a more adult form. There is a lot of language problems in the video. The launch date is incorrect in the video. Um, they launched it and then canceled it the same day, the first time. I would worry, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't get any worries sorted out before backing. Um, it's well past its goal. People are going to get this if they picked it up, but... I mean, I would encourage them to get a lot of proofreading before um, they they let anything go. If it's anything like what's in the uh, the video, artwork looks okay. It's a hex-based tile system. Um, you know, it's 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 just hard for me to, to get past. You know, not polishing it up to that degree. There are other options. They don't have as nice of minis in the other options for horror games. Um, that fit this niche depends on what you want and I'm getting the heave ho by a certain cartoon dog that wants me to uh, get uh, their stuff out for you to be able to watch next week so when you're not watching me maybe you're gonna be watching it I hope you guys have a fun time hope you had fun with your moms or will have fun with your moms all that kind of cool stuff I am thinking about playing some zombicide uh, soon on the channel throwing that out there as a suggestion if you have other suggestions i might think about um you know just I, i've been thinking about killing some zombies I, I think it would be a lot of fun i played a lot of street masters recently on the video and the act of uh just sitting at the cameras and all that every time i want to play something it's just kind of killing the fun <laughs> on that one i've got one more episode out i'm gonna do that and then i'm gonna play through it on my own uh, a little bit without the camera and uh, you know get some of that fun back but I think um, just having a different game different setup different feel like with Zombicide might you know just give me some of that uh, encouragement to uh, do more fun stuff um, other than just making the episodes in the live section uh, you let me know if that'll work for you otherwise if you can subscribe that would be great if you haven't already that's always gonna help everybody who's a creator you don't have to get notified for every little thing. It just means that, hey, you like the channel. Maybe you'd like some future content and you think that uh, YouTube should eventually give those small creators a couple bucks. So if you can do that for me, just cost you a button click. And if you want to be notified when I got new episodes, just make sure the notification bell's on. And uh, that's all you need to do. And I'll make sure you're informed with whatever's coming out in uh, the board game, RPG, war game space. Even though there wasn't much war for war games this week. You know, sometimes things come, sometimes they don't. But uh, otherwise, I hope you enjoy yourself. And as the weather is getting warm, don't forget.